We're beginning our studies of protein structure in Chapter 4. In this lesson, we'll be looking specifically at the structure of amino acids, but more particularly at the hydrophobic amino acids. Let's first clarify what we mean by a protein. We have illustrated here on the screen a figure from your book showing three proteins in space filling model. On the upper left, we have a fragment of DNA polymerase. On the right, we have insulin. And on the bottom, we have multiporin. As you can see, most proteins are globular in their general structure. However, there is a difference. In the DNA polymerase fragment, there is only one polypeptide chain. In insulin, there are two, and that's differentially colored in blue. And in multiporin, there are three. So hopefully from this, you can see that the terms protein and polypeptide are not interchangeable. The protein is considered the functional unit, whether that's one polypeptide chain, two, or three. More on protein structure later. Let's first look at the general structure of an amino acid. So here's the general structure. We have our central or alpha carbon here. Attached to that is a hydrogen atom, an alpha carboxy group, an alpha amine group, and the side chain because all of these functional groups are in the alpha position with respect to that central carbon, that's why it's referred to as the alpha carbon. And of course, the nature of the side chain, or R group, is what distinguishes the 20 common amino acids. Each one has their own unique set of functional groups, and that gives each one its own unique type of chemistry, either as an amino acid or within a protein. Now, because those side chains might contain carboxy or amino groups, we have to distinguish those in the side chain from those connected to that central carbon, and that's why we call the, those the alpha carboxy and alpha amine groups. Pictured here, we have the protonation state of an amino acid at pH 7, and so this would be the Zwitter ion, that is the double or twin ion, unless there's an ionizable side chain. So you'll notice there's a negative 1 charge on the carboxy group, a plus 1 on the amino group, and the net charge is 0. Because of the presence of these carboxy and amino groups, every amino acid has at least these two ionizable groups, and every amino acid has both acid and base properties. Hopefully from this you can see why we needed to consider pH and pK in their relationship to one another before we could really understand amino acid structure and function. Another general feature of amino acids is their chirality. Remember, a chiral carbon is one that's bound to four different functional groups. In the example at the top, we have glyceraldehyde. It has four functional groups. In the left, the OH group is on the left. That's L-glyceraldehyde. D-glyceraldehyde, the OH, is on the right. Notice that these are non-superimposable mirror images, and that gives them a feature uh, in which they rotate polarized light. L-glyceraldehyde rotates it to the left, that's levorotatory, and D-glyceraldehyde rotates to the right, that's dextrorotatory. So in a similar way, we can have L and D amino acids that are non-superimposable mirror images because we have four functional groups attached to that central carbon. In the L amino acid, the amine group is on the left. Notice that's analogous to L-glyceraldehyde and the D amino acid, the amine group, is on the right. Stereochemistry in amino acids does play a role in overall protein structure, and so we want to get this principle clear in our minds. We find that all amino acids that are found in proteins are the L enantiomer. It would be more accurate to refer to the amino acid as L alanine, but because most are the L enantiomers, we tend to drop that designation and simply refer to the name. We can classify our amino acids by those R groups or side chains. The ones that have nonpolar R groups are referred to as hydrophobic. The ones that have polar R groups are hydrophilic. Keep in mind, however, every amino acid is polar. They all have ionizable groups. It only has to do with the nature of that side chain. Within the polar R groups, we can classify them further as being charged or uncharged. We're going to look at the polar amino acids in a later video, but in this one we want to focus on those nonpolar groups. Let's look at the simplest amino acid, glycine. It doesn't really have a side chain. It has a hydrogen atom, and this is probably why your book classifies it as polar, because there's an absence of a nonpolar chain. However, as we'll see later as we, when we look at polar amino acids, there's no electron withdrawing group here. 
So for our purposes, we want to be clear, glycine is considered nonpolar. Notice further we can classify the amino acid by its structure, by its full name glycine, by a three letter code gly in this case, or the single letter code G. You want to become familiar with all 20 common amino acids, their structures, full names, three letter codes, and one letter codes. And part of go the reason for going through this exercise is to help you in that process. Did you notice that glycine is the only amino acid that is not chiral? Next we have alanine and phenylalanine. These have hydrophobic or nonpolar side chains. In alanine we have a methyl group. And here's phenylalanine. It also has that same methyl group, but attached to that is a phenyl ring, hence the name phenylalanine. You'll notice in the single letter code for phenylalanine we have an F. That's because we're going to use the P for proline. So we have to give it another letter, and using F for phenylalanine makes some sense there. You'll notice also that although these are both nonpolar, phenylalanine would be considered more nonpolar. So even with regard to being hydrophobic, we can put them on a scale. The more surface area, the more nonpolar the side chain. Remember the hydrophobic effect? In the case of phenylalanine, we'd have to order a great deal more of those water molecules to surround it, and so it's more nonpolar than alanine. Next we have valine, leucine, and isoleucine. The side chains are highlighted in green. If we compare valine and leucine, we'll see that they're very similar. Leucine has an extra methylene group, and so we can distinguish them in that way. And now if we compare leucine and isoleucine, we can see there are the same functional groups there, but they're just arranged a little bit differently, and that's why we refer to them as leucine and isoleucine. Next we have methionine. It's, only, it's one of only two amino acids that has a sulfur in its side chain. Here's tryptophan. It's the only amino acid with a fused ring system, so it's pretty easy to spot. Look at that single letter code, W. That might be a little hard to remember. Here's a little mnemonic for you. It's tryptophan or twiptophan, so maybe that'll help. Now because of that fused ring structure, remember those bases in DNA and RNA? They had alternating single and double bonds, they had a resonant ring, and because of that they absorbed light at 260 nanometers. That's true for tryptophan as well, only it absorbs light at 280 nanometers. The significance of this is most proteins have at least one tryptophan, and therefore we can measure the absorbance of light at 280 nanometers and that gives us an idea of the amount of protein that's present, that is the protein concentration. Here's proline, a rather unusual amino acid. It's the only one whose side chain loops back on its own backbone. So if you look here, this is actually the alpha amine right here. And so that's what we mean by it looping back on itself. And because of this, it is the only amino acid. It has a unique feature in that it in tends to induce kinks in polypeptide sequences. So again, the identity of that side chain, its chemical group and structure, has much to do with its function within proteins. In our next lesson, we'll look at the structures of the hydrophilic amino acids.